Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, it's, it's, very, it's a great pleasure to be here, a pleasure and an honor. And uh, thank you for those uh, uh, very generous uh, uh, opening remarks. Um, so uh, what I was going to do today, or this evening, was I'm going to talk a little bit about this book that Daron and I uh, wrote. Uh, I'm going to try to give an overview of the argument and the basic ideas. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the application in the light of the conference, which is about the future role of the World Bank and IMF and uh, financial, world financial institutions uh, aid. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, somewhat reluctantly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of the framework in the book uh, for development aid and how you should think about aid and what would be the role of uh, financial institutions or multilater multilateral institutions in uh, trying to solve the problems of poor countries. So I, I, I somewhat reluctantly do that. Uh, we do have some stuff about that in the last chapter. Uh, the co-authors co disagreed strenuously about, uh, about the nature and form and even the existence of that last chapter, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to show a consolidated front this evening. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what's the book about? Uh, you know, the book, in some sense, is an attempt to find a simple way to put together a lot of the work that Daron and I have done uh, together and with uh, Simon Johnson in the last 15 years. Uh, theoretical work, empirical work, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a very historical setting. I, I should say, you know, one of the sort of personal motivations for writing this book was that uh, 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 over the years, we've been very influenced in the problems that we've thought about and the way we've thought about them by reading very eclectic uh, things, history, anthropology, political science, sociology. I started off as an economist and nowadays I'm a political scientist. I, call my, I like to call myself a recovering economist. And, you know, so uh, the, our inspiration has sort of come from all over the map. But when you have to publish papers in economics journals, you have, to, you have to strip out all of these things because referees and editors don't find them interesting. So a lot of the stories and kind of empirical cases that we've been very inspired by never appeared in any of our papers for that reason. And so this was a chance to sort of put those in to a kind of publishable form in the thought that, you know, well, hey, if they inspired us, perhaps they'll inspire somebody else as well, you know. So, so that was also part of the motivation. Okay, so without further ado, what's the book uh, about? Well, the book is really about this uh, somewhat blurred uh, picture, uh, which is just using data from Angus Madison to look at uh, traje historical trajectories of income per capita uh, over the past uh, millennium in different parts of the world. In some sense, you know, the starting motivation is just looking around the world today, differences in income per capita, development outcomes, uh, life expectancy, education, human development, etc. Those differ enormously. So we want to propose a simple framework for thinking about those differences, you know, building on the shoulders of many giants, as Anand alluded to, particularly uh, the work of Doug, Doug North. Uh, uh, but here I also emphasize, you know, and the book emphasizes the historical uh, patterns also. So the book is sort of hoping that the framework will explain not just income differences today, so, you know, why Uzbekistan and Zimbabwe have different levels of income per capita than the United States, but also to try to understand in some sense how this world uh, inequality emerged historically. You know, why do you need to bother with all the historical stuff? Well, because it's fascinating, and because also I think that understanding the historical processes helps you get a handle on what a plausible type of explanation uh, might be. So, so, so it's both powerful uh, from a scientific point of view, not just kind of interesting intellectual or otherwise. Okay, so the book proposes a, a sort of institutional uh, explanation for these patterns both today and historically. But rather than starting with lots of definitions and things like that, uh, I'm going to just start by telling you a story uh, about the emergence of, uh, of inequality within the Americas. And then I'll tell that story for five minutes or 10 minutes. And then I'll try to use that to abstract the kind of principle, the kind of basic building blocks of the theory. Okay, so what do I, what's the story about? Well, the story is about 
the divergence in development outcomes within the Americas. So if you think about the Americas and, you, you know, the, the difference between the richest country in the, in the Americas, the United States, and the poorest, which is Haiti, more or less spans, you know, the entire world inequality. But if you go back 500 years to the start of European colonization of the Americas, that was somehow very different. In fact, the countries, the, the countries, the polities, which had uh, the highest level of development, at least technological sophistication, political centralization, were not in North America or in the southern cone of Latin America. They were in the central, they were in the central valley of Mexico or they were in Andean South America. So, so there was what we called a, a great reversal of fortune over the last 500 years in the Americas. And the argument is that that's very closely related to the type of colonial societies that got created in different parts of the Americas. Why is that interesting? It's interesting not because the Americas were some sort of tabula rasa, but I think it's interesting in, because studying how that reversal took place. So it's not just divergence. It's not just that, you know, the United States and uh, Guatemala had the same income per capita and then the United States got much richer, the actual situation got reversed during the colonial period. So it's even more dramatic in some sense than, the, than this divergence. That studying that, how that divergence, how that reversal took place, reveals a lot about the types of mechanisms that create poverty and prosperity. So I'm going to give you a very, the first chapter of the book tries to sort of tell this story. And uh, so I'll give you a, I'll kind of give a quick version of that, and then I'll talk about some of the general principles we abstract from that, the kind of building blocks of the theory, okay? And I'm going to start off with a very sort of, you know, simple kind of dichotomy between societies that do well economically and societies that do badly economically, and I'm going to try to introduce a language for talking about the institutions of societies that do well and societies do badly, and that's going to be very kind of simplistic and dichotomous. Of course, in reality, it's all shades of grey, but I think, you know, nuance is easier to cope with once you have some building blocks in place. Okay, so, so, so let's start thinking about the historical uh, economic trajectories of different parts of the Americas and how that was impacted by the colonial system. So, what happened when the Spanish came to the New World? Well, conquistadors arrived in different places. They arrived, you know, in the mainland. They arrived first in uh, Mexico. Uh, they arrived subsequently on the northern coast of uh, Colombia or in, you know, in the, the plate estuary. Uh, and the conquistadors came with a particular kind of model of how to exploit uh, the colonial world. When Cortes captured uh, Tenochtitlan, when he captured uh, uh, Montezuma, the, 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 the kind of the head of the Mexicas, what he did was uh, he monopolized the most important scarce resource. Of course, the Mexicas had, you know, they had precious metals and whatever, but the most valuable resource was the people. So after the Mexicas had been defeated militarily in Mexico, Cortes divided the people into what, he, what were called grants of encomiendas. An encomienda was essentially a grant of indigenous people, uh, usually in a sort of particular geographical uh, area, to a Spaniard. And what did the indigenous people do? The indigenous people gave tribute, labor services, etc., to the Spanish. So right from the beginning, the kind of military superiority of the Spanish created a very hierarchical, unequal society based on the exploitation of indigenous people for the benefit of the conquistadors. The colonization of Argentina is one of the most f interesting examples of this. Argentina, of course, today has this reputation of this wonderfully kind of uh, function, well, it's not very functional actually, but it has this wonderfully sophisticated uh, society uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a much more uh, kind of developed place in many ways, kind of from a socioeconomic point of view, than other parts of Latin America. But initially, it was very unattractive uh, to the Spanish. Why was that? Because there were no indigenous people to enslave or exploit in Buenos Aires. In fact, Buenos Aires was abandoned by the Spanish as soon as they discovered the Guarani up the river in Paraguay. So the Guarani were a densely, pop, densely settled agricultural society with kind of hierarchy. The Spanish abandoned the plate and the whole uh, pampa, 
moved up the river and took over Guarani uh, society because this was a much more attractive uh, socioeconomic environment uh, to function in the colonial world. Okay, so what emerged in colonial South America was this very unequal uh, society, hierarchical, based on the exploitation of the great mass of people by a small elite. Very similar type of society emerged in the colonial period in South Africa, for example. It's not a coincidence that South Africa has a level of inequality of a Latin American country, because South Africa was based on the same model of uh, exploitation of a vast mass of indigenous people by a small uh, European elite who gained control of the land, who created labor market institutions to extract rents from indigenous people to their benefit. What's happened in North America? Well, 1607 uh, is the traditional date for the start of colonization in North America. That's the founding of the Jamestown colony in Virginia. What was the Virginia colony? It was run by the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company was a profit-making enterprise. The Virginia Company weren't there to propagate the common law or cricket or cucumber sandwiches. They were there to make money. And so the colonists came and they wanted to make money. And they had a model for how you made money in the Americas. What was their model? Their model was, first thing you do, you capture the local Indian chief. Just like Cortes captured Montezuma, or Pizarro captured Atahualpa in Peru, or, in, or, or um, the same thing happened all over the place. In Colombia, the king was called King Bacata. He was captured by, uh, by the Spaniards in what's now Bogota, named after him. They had the same model. You capture the Indian chief. Once you capture the Indian chief, you get control over the society, and then you just create this wonderful rentier, rentier society. The Indians work for you, you extract tribute, forced labor. That was a model that was very effective in Highland Colombia, or Peru, or Bolivia, or Guatemala, or Mexico, but it didn't work in Virginia. The population was too thin on the ground. There was a local chief called Wahun Sunakok. He was sort of head of this confederation, this loose confederation of, of groups, of polities. But he didn't have the same kind of mechanisms or authority that Atahualpa Montezuma or even King Bacata did. So what happened? Well, the second winter, two thirds of the colony of Jamestown starved to death. Why did they starve to death? Because they didn't bother planting crops. That's not how you colonize the Americas. You didn't plant crops. You got the Indians to work for you and they brought you food and gold and loot. So the first, the early part of the colony was a complete disaster. The Virginia Company didn't make any money, so they thought, okay, this is no good, let's try another strategy. Here's part of the strategy in action. They imposed these draconian rules on the colony. You can see here's the first, this is the first of the rules. It says, no man or woman shall run away from the colony to the Indians upon pain of death. And more or less everything here you could see was punishable by pain of death. The first clause is, is kind of rather significant uh, because the Virginia Company decided if you can't exploit the indigenous people, let's exploit the English people. So they put everyone in barracks, they separated men and women, they introduced this very draconian work regime. What was the response of English people? They ran off to live with the Indians, they wouldn't put up with it. So there was another very unsuccessful experience, that's not the whole story, you know, there's another part of the story is that it's difficult to exploit English people. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, but it's easier to exploit Congolese or, you know, uh, or, or, uh, or, or Mexicas than English people. So, but this experience of a kind of trying to extract rents from English people didn't work well. I mean, the obvious reason why it didn't work well also is that once the Virginia Company recognized you couldn't create a colony by exploiting the indigenous people, then they needed to get more English people to come. And it was difficult to get English people to come if they were being uh, viciously exploited. So in 1619, the Virginia Company did something radical. You know, after 12 years of sort of unsuccessful experiments, it gave up basically on the, this kind of draconian model. It freed people from their labor contracts. A lot of them were indentured laborers. It gave everyone 50 acres of land. It sort of gave up on the fiction that all the land was owned by the Virginia Company. And even more interesting, to underpin that, it introduced this general assembly. So there's some controversy amongst historians about what the franchise was exactly, but the, the consensus view seems to be this was basically a universal male suffrage. 
Now, this was not the implantation of British institutions. Britain didn't have universal male suffrage until 300 years after this. So this was a response to trying to find a set of institutions which would make the colony prosper. And I think the key thing here is that once this system of exploitation didn't work, they decided that they'd have to give people incentives. Okay? So this here, it seems, is, I think, I would argue, the book argues, this is the origin of you know, this distinct institutional trajectory of the United States. It's the origin of uh, democracy uh, in the United States. And the same struggle played out in other colonies. So Pennsylvania, Maryland, Carolinas. These were two, these were set up, you know, the Maryland and the Carolinas in particular, were set up as very autocratic uh, you know, hierarchical uh, colonies, and they broke down in the same way that Virginia broke down. So, so, so what you see in the early colonial period is a very similar kind of model, but the conditions, the initial conditions, led to very different outcomes. In the US, you had this uh, system where economic incentives sort of emerged, uh, political power came to be relatively equally distributed. Why was that? Well, because the Virginia Company wanted to get people to believe that this system was going to stick, that your property rights to land or your economic opportunities were going to endure, and to somehow to guarantee that, you had to give people political power. It wasn't just enough to announce this thing. In Latin America, you had something very different. You had this unequal society based on exploitation of indigenous people. Now, this was all happening a long time ago. You might ask, well, what's that got to do with differences in income per capita or inequality between Colombia and the United States today? Well, everything, I think, is the answer, because what you see after that is, in some sense, a path-dependent process which is unleashed by these beginnings. Let me give you one very brief example. In the 19th century, uh, the world economy expanded, transportation costs fell, the first wave of globalization after 1850. Suddenly, all of this so-called frontier land was uh, valuable. The United States, of course, had this mythical frontier in the West, but almost every other country in Latin America, except possibly El Salvador and Haiti, uh, had a frontier as well. And most, Latin, I mean, Colombia had a frontier, Chile had a frontier, Argentina had a frontier, and lots of those countries have frontier myths, just like the United States. Colombians have lots of frontier myths. So every country had a frontier. What's the difference between the United States and Latin America? It's the way the frontier was allocated. So with the exception of Costa Rica, the United States, the way the frontier land was allocated is very distinct. So the Homestead Act, basically allowed for this very egalitarian distribution of frontier land. Most parts of Latin America, what you had instead was enormously oligarchical, inegalitarian distribution of frontier lands. So you have the same asset, the same kind of economic asset, but allocated in very different ways with very different consequences. In the United States, it sort of reproduces this uh, initial equilibrium. In Latin America, it reproduces another very different inegalitarian equilibrium. Okay, so, so in the first chapter, we try to tell part of the story of how these, this path-dependent development processes sort of unwind over time and how you know, some new opportunity arises, the Industrial Revolution, frontier expansion, but that has very different consequences depending on the initial situation it finds. Okay. In fact, you know, uh, just to see, you know, even today you can see some of the imprint of these historical institutions in Latin America. This is some work uh, by Melissa Dell, uh, from, who was a student of mine in Daron's, who looked at uh, the long-run implication of the largest system of forced labor in colonial Latin America, which was the Potosí Mita. So the Potosí Mita was a huge system of coerced labor stretching throughout Andean, Peru, and Bolivia, which was used to mobilize indigenous labor for the silver mines in Potosí. And what Melissa showed is that, you know, if you look at the boundary today, so if you look, it was a huge catchment area which was determined in the 1570s, and everybody, you know, so everybody inside the catchment area was subject to uh, this labor draft. And what Melissa did was she looked at the boundary of the, the meter. And what you see if you look at places today, the meter was abolished in 1825. Just inside the boundary and just outside, you find places that were historically subject to the meter have household consumption levels one third lower 
people are much less involved in the market, the density of infrastructure is lower, educational attainment, at least until very recently, was lower. So some of these institutions, you still see the imprint today. That's not the big story. The big story is the story of path dependent. You know, the world changes, but the way it changes is heavily conditioned by the past. Okay, so, so, uh, so the story here, let me talk about some of the building blocks behind this story, okay? So I, I painted this very stylized picture between the emergence of economic and political society in Latin America as opposed to North America, okay? And uh, we use a terminology to talk about the economic incentives, okay? And the way I'm gonna talk about uh, economic institutions in uh, Latin America such as the Potosi Mita, is as extractive, okay? Whereas in the United States, we use this language of inclusive economic institutions. What's important about inclusive economic institutions? So let me give you another example from 19th century US. If you look at what do economists think drive long-run economic growth? Technological change, innovation, new products, new goods, new ways of doing things. Innovation is crucial. If you look at patenting records, so patenting uh, is a way of looking at innovators and innovation. You know, if you look at the British Industrial Revolution, for example, uh, when the Industrial Revolution starts in the middle of the 18th century, patenting suddenly goes through the roof. So patenting tracks very well this big spurt of innovation, which was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. In the United States in the 19th century, if you look at patenting records and you look at who were the patentees, who took out a patent, who had an idea, an invention that they wanted to develop, what you see is that it comes from all over the social spectrum. So elites, non-elites, farmers, you know, artisans, professional people, lawyers, doctors, so unskilled workers. Uh, so ideas, talents, skills, creativity is widely distributed in society. So what you need is a set of institutions that allows people with ideas and talents and drive to take advantage of those things, to, to take advantage of economic opportunities, to open a firm, to get property rights on their ideas. And that's in some sense like at some kind of root level what having an inclusive economy is all about. If you have extractive economic institutions like the Potosimita or the Encomienda or slavery, there was a huge web of restrictions on markets, on transactions in the Spanish colonial period, monopolies. Those systematically block that kind of, those kind of channels of opportunity, okay? And that explains why Latin American countries are both more unequal and uh, poorer uh, today. So, so extractive and ex inclusive economic institutions. So that's very standard economics at some level. Economics is all about incentives, right? Excent incentives and opportunities about how markets, you know, create incentives, create efficient allocation of resources. That's key. But what lies behind different sets of institutions? That's politics, okay? So our theory really emphasizes that what lies behind different sets of economic institutions and what's fundamental for understanding divergence in institutions or the dynamic institutions are the politics, okay? So we emphasize that underpinning extractive economic institutions, which limit opportunity, create barriers, monopolies, etc., are extracted political institutions. And so it's crucial to see how the politics and the economics kind of co-evolve in these examples. So lying behind the inclusive economic institutions of the United States were inclusive political institutions. So let me emphasize two things about inclusive political institutions. What on earth does that piece of jargon mean? Well, two things. Uh, broad distribution of political power. That's one thing, what a political scientist would call pluralism. The other thing we emphasize is political centralization. So to have inclusive political institutions, you need to have political centralization. Let me motivate that with an example, which is of, uh, from Somalia. So the, the most famous ethnography of the Somali clans uh, in East Africa was written by a Welsh social anthropologist called Yon Lewis. And the book is called A Pastoral Democracy.
The title is very significant because when he looked at the political organization of the Somali clans, he said, this is incredibly democratic for men, for men. How did Somali clans make decisions? Adult men got together and collectively made democratic decisions about what to do. But that didn't lead to inclusive economic institutions, for example, uh, public good provision or equality of opportunity in Somalia. It led to anarchy because there was absolutely no state to kind of regulate the interactions between these clans. So, so a very broad distribution of political rights in the absence of a functioning state, and I'll give more examples later, does, doesn't create the foundations for inclusive economic institutions. Okay, so those two things. So extractive political institutions can occur either because politically power is, political power is narrowly concentrated, as it was in Spanish colonial world, uh, and it, as it is in many Latin American countries today still, or because there isn't this process of political uh, centralization or state formation. Okay, so uh, here's a little uh, diagram that our editor said was too complicated to have in the book. Uh, uh, this is just to try to give you the idea. Okay, it's very, it's very you know, stark at the moment. So in the book, we emphasize that in some sense, long run economic growth is driven by this combination of economic institute, inclusive economic institutions underpinned by inclusive political institutions. And you know, if we look at, if we wanted to sort the world, countries in the world into two bins, which you might think is too radical a thing to do, uh, the countries which are in the wealthy bin would be inclusive, inclusive, and the countries in the poor bin, I'm gonna give some more examples, would be extractive, extractive. And we emphasize a lot, just like in my story about the Americas, that these things are very sort of inertial. You know, you can see why that is. You know, if you start off with a society where political power is very narrowly distributed, where you get, you know, like in colonial Latin America or in South Africa under apartheid, you get an economy which is set up for the small politically powerful group to slant wealth and income in their favor, then that naturally tends to lead the initial distribution of political power to persist over time. Similarly, in an inclusive society, a broad distribution of political rights tends to generate a broader distribution of income or assets, which tends to lead the initial political situation to reproduce itself. So you could think that these things are very inertial. Nevertheless, in some sense, if I was gonna talk about the historical dynamics, I'd be telling a story about how Historically, most countries had this extractive, uh, extractive combination, but nevertheless, they made a transition to more inclusive uh, societies. Okay, so so you can make a transition, you know, either this way or that way, and you know, we could talk about some examples. But what we emphasise in the book about the off diagonals is that the off diagonals tend to be unstable. Okay, it's very difficult to have a society. Take South Africa, you know. In 1994, South Africa, South Africa used to have extractive political system and extractive economic system. In 1994, the political system opened and black people got political, black people could vote. What happened? Could you have apartheid economic institutions with uh, universal suffrage in South Africa? No. What was apartheid, what's an example of an apartheid economic institution? The color bar. The color bar was a, was, a, was a set of occupations that only white people could occupy. No black people could be lawyers, doctors, boiler makers, carpenters, bricklayers. So this was a set of occupations which kept skilled wages high for white people and forced black people to work in unskilled jobs in mines and farms. But once political power was equally distributed, that you couldn't possibly have the color bar anymore. So, so the color bar disappeared along with a lot of other apartheid era legislation. So, so you couldn't have a situation where political power was inclusive and economic institutions were extractive. That's just sort of unstable, okay? Maybe the whites could have mounted a coup d'etat and uh, you'd have moved back to extractive, extractive, or you know, the economic institutions have to change and you move here. So for now, I just wanna say that the off diagonals are, are unstable, okay? That's the main thing for now, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, we emphasize growth under inclusive institutions is, you know, that's uh, sustainable, that's a sustainable uh, situation, and that tends to be uh, 
once you have an inclusive society, there's many forces which lead that to persist over time. Uh, not that any set of institutions aren't, you know, always being challenged. Even in an inclusive society, there's always an incentive, you know, for Wall Street financiers to capture politics and create more rents for themselves and set up an extractive society. And usually when I talk about uh, the United States, I'm not an American citizen. Uh, so, you know, I, don't I feel I can be objective and dispassionate about the United States. You know, nowadays people are very pessimistic about the United States. They think the United States is becoming kind of oligarchized and that it's moving from this box here, you know, into this box here and possibly back into that box here. And what we do in the book is we sort of say, you know, we show, you know, yes, we emphasize this persistence of inclusive, inclusive and extractive, extractive. But we also show how institutions are always challenged in some sense. And, and you know, but, 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 but at least so far, the inclusive economic and political institutions of the United States have been resilient to challenges. Perhaps we can talk more about that if people want to ask me questions about it. So the bottom line is, you know, thinking about world inequality today, and I'll give some very specific examples in a second, is we try to sort of say, well, countries that are poor tend to have this combination of extractive economic and political institutions, and countries that are economically successful tend to have this combination of inclusive, inclusive, and countries that make the transition are, you know, countries that change their institutions. Think about China since 1978. What did China do starting in the 1970s? It moved from a very extractive society here in the direction of more inclusive economic institutions. The first thing that happened in China was this reform in the rural sector, this introduction of the household responsibility system, the introduction of incentives into agriculture. I often hear, you know, going around uh, talking about this stuff, you know, I hear a lot about the, the great Chinese model, you know, but the Chinese model is not a model of brilliant, successful state-run development. The Chinese model is a model of economic success coming because the Communist Party started you know, stopped trying to control every aspect of society. It allowed people to start making decisions, creating incentives in agriculture, then moving into industry, with the Communist Party sort of catching up and reluctantly recognizing that this stuff was going on. So, so that's a transition from this situation here into this box here. Uh, what, what about the future for that? Well, the, what the theory suggests is that this is unsustainable. The off-diagonals are unstable. So uh, you can't have this combination of inclusive and extractive, okay? But hasn't the Chinese economy do, been doing so well for so long? How could you possibly say that? Well, I'm skipping some of my slides here, sorry. I, I only have these really to sort of, you know, provide uh, reassurance more than anything else. Oh yeah, that, that, now I'm really out of sync, sorry. Uh, let me remind you of something, you know, uh, we're thinking about the Chinese growth miracle. When I was an undergraduate at London School of Economics, uh, of course, that's, you know, that's a long time ago and Chinese economic growth had barely started, but there was a different growth miracle and that was the Soviet Union. And as we read Paul Samuelson's textbook, we found that, uh, at least in the 1961 edition, the Soviet Union's GDP was going to catch up with uh, the US in 2000. Uh, was still there 2000 and 1967. By the 1970 version, it had slipped to 2010. Uh, a decade later, it had slipped to 2020. After that, the, this picture stayed the same, but instead of having USSR real GDP, we had Chinese GDP. <laughs> so, so the, we've now forgotten, you see, everybody laughs, but when I was an undergraduate, the Soviet Union had been growing very successfully for 40 years, and many leaders in the third world, such as Nkrumah, for example, in Ghana, were convinced that this was a successful model of in sustained industrialization, okay? So, the Chinese have many advantages over the Soviet Union. They've managed to introduce inclusive economic institutions much more successfully than uh, the Soviet Union uh, did uh, but, you know, this is just a kind of stark way of emphasizing, you know, there's many parallels and there's many non-parallels between Soviet and the Chinese experience. Let's just try to emphasize in a very stark way the prediction of the, of the theory, uh, which is that, you know, this unsustainability of the off-diagonals.
Okay, so let me not talk about that. Let me just talk about uh, the emergence of world inequality. Okay, so, so, so everywhere in the world was, uh, what's the dynamic story? Everywhere in the world had this extractive institutions. How is it that institutions uh, change? Uh, um, does the World Bank come along uh, and uh, say, uh, you know, was it the World Bank came along to the apartheid regime in South Africa and said, good, good grief, this is an extremely irrational way of running the economy. All these distortions, I mean, it's leading to an inefficient allocation of resources. No, no. The way that, you know, the system collapsed in South Africa was the way that many institutions changed. You know, we've just been living through the Arab Spring, so I don't need to tell you that collective action drives uh, institutional change. So, the story that we have in the book is that, you know, and that's the same true about Britain. At some proximate level, the emergence of world economy, you know, world inequality today is linked to the Industrial Revolution, which happened in Britain in the 18th century, and the very uneven distribution, the very uneven dissemination of the ideas and technologies and methodologies for improving productivity, which emanated from the Industrial Revolution. So why did the Industrial Revolution disseminate very unevenly? Because of the very different institutions in different parts of the world. So some parts of the world, like Britain, developed through conflict in the early modern period, particularly in the 17th century, inclusive political and economic institutions. Other parts of the world in the 19th century developed those through a very different channel. So you know, the institutional dynamics of Britain or Western Europe are not the same as those as North America and Australia. Uh, you know, the early conflicts in the foundation of uh, the kind of modern Australian society in the late 18th century are very similar to those in the United States. So they ended up with inclusive uh, political and economic institutions, and the Industrial Revolution spread to those countries. Other parts of the world, Eastern Europe, which had diverged from Western Europe in the late medieval and early modern period, or the Ottoman Empire, had very extractive political and economic institutions, and they didn't benefit from the economic opportunities that were created by the Industrial Revolution. So that's a it's a, it's, a, it's a theory of how some parts of the world made this transition away from extractive institutions to inclusive institutions. And the theory very much emphasizes conflict, like my examples of South Africa, you know, or, or, or you know, even my US example, Virginia Company, the Arab Spring, political conflict in 17th century Britain, the French Revolution. You know, these are conflicts over institutions. You know, there's, Institutions are inherently distributive in their impact on income and wealth, on power. There's going to be conflict over that. And there's always conflict over institutions. One of the things we emphasize in the book, of course, though, is that conflicts don't necessarily, conflicts lead to institutional change, but they don't necessarily lead to beneficial institutional change. So one of the things I'm going to emphasize at the end when I talk a little bit about policy is what type of circumstances lead to desirable institutional change. You know, there's an, there's an idea in sociology that we talk about in the book called the iron law of oligarchy. And the notion of the iron law of oligarchy is, you know, there's always conflict in society, conflict over institutions and the organization of society. And often there's the, there's the appearance of change, but that can just be a new oligarchy replacing an old oligarchy with no real important change in the way the society functions other than, you know, who's on top and who's at the bottom. So, one way of interesting asking the question is, you know, when is it you get a transition from extractive institutions to something more inclusive rather than just a reproduction of extractive institutions under a different guise? Okay, so uh, that means if we look around the world today, poor countries uh, should be characterized by uh, extractive institutions. One of the problems with having such a simple language, of course, is that details, you know, are important and details differ a lot. So in the chapter where we talk about why nations fail today, we go through a whole lot of different examples. Egypt, Colombia, North Korea, Uzbekistan, Zimbabwe, Sierra Leone, Argentina. You might say, how on earth could you possibly compare those countries? They all have different histories, their institutions differ. Some were ex-Spanish you know, colonies, some were ex-British colonies, some were ex-communist uh, satellites. Well, we all try to sort of say, yes, a lot of the details are different, but we can think of all of these places as 
The fundamental problem of development is that they have extractive political institutions and extractive economic institutions. Uh, you know, here's one example. Uh, this is uh, Zimbabwe. This is President Mugabe uh, in Zimbabwe. You probably you may not know, but in 2000, President Mugabe won the lottery. Okay. So, so, so this is not a good sign of uh, a broad distribution of political power or the existence of checks and balances when the president wins the lottery. Uh, a completely different example would be Uzbekistan. You know, Uzbekistan, what's Uzbekistan got in common with Zimbabwe? Very narrow distribution of political power and extractive economic institutions manifested in many different ways. Uh, the thing we talk about in the book is labor coercion. So in Uzbekistan, there's still a system of mass labor coercion, which involves mobilizing the entire population of school children to pick the cotton crop. There's many other ways, you know, farmers are forced to grow cotton, they're paid prices far below world levels. President Karimov and his family sort of gradually taking over most of the productive assets in the society. Here's a country also poor with extractive institutions. Here's a very different type of example from Colombia. So, uh, you know, who are these guys? Uh, these guys are warlords. Uh, this guy, this is, this guy, gentleman is called Salvatore Mancuso. He's called uh, Jorge Cuarenta. You see he signs himself George Forty. Uh, he has, a, you know, this is a gentleman called Don Berner. He calls himself here Adolfo Paz, whoops, rather ironically, uh, and this gentleman is called Diego Vecino. Uh, what is this? The, what's the Pact of Santa Fe de Ralito? It's a pact that these warlords signed with Colombian politicians, governors, mayors, national senators, national congressmen, uh, demanding the refounding of the nation. What they were really doing, of course, was making a deal to fix uh, elections in 2002. You might ask, isn't it rather odd that warlords would sign an uh, agreement like this, you know, with politicians? I mean, why, you know, isn't that sort of strange? Wouldn't you just kind of sh winked at each other or something or raised your eyebrow if you were British? Uh, you know, and maybe this is a sort of cultural thing. You have to, you know, Anglo-Saxons can't get this, but one of my Colombian students said when I asked him, isn't it weird that they'd write all this down? He said, you know, the only thing which is odd about this is it wasn't notarized. <laughs> so what's, what's this an example of? This is an example of a national state that is very uncentralized. You know, the Colombian national state delegates rule of a vast area of its country to people like Don Berner and George Forty. So this is a system of kind of decentralized rule where, where you know, the state doesn't provide order or basic public goods in large parts of the country. So this is another situation. This is very different from Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan has a quite strong centralized state as a consequence of the Soviet history. So here, extractive institutions are something rather different, but they still have the consequence of blocking uh, inclusive economic institutions. OK, so, so let me talk about policy. I'll come back to ex-President ex -president Cardoso in a second. OK, so if you were thinking about how to think about policy and how to think about changing this, uh, the first thing I guess the book would suggest is that you need to think about the politics. I would say that, you know, at some logical level, you know, you'd think that economics and politics interact, that politics affects economics or economics affects politics. But I think one of the things we try to emphasize in the book is that, you know, logic aside, our sense is very much that political transition precedes economic transition. You know, after all, what started all of this business in China after the 1970s? An enormous political conflict between Deng Xiaoping and the Gang of Four over what, you know, model for Chinese society. You know, if you look at the British case, it's political conflict, a trans political transition that precedes economic uh, transition. Uh, so I guess, you know, the, the, the one basic message here is that to generate economic change, Political change uh, is really uh, necessary, okay? And a particular type of political change, going back to this notion of the iron law of oligarchy. Right at the end of the book, we talk about, you know, Brazil and political and economic transition uh, in, in Brazil, 
uh, which, which uh, Professor Wade was talking about earlier, if you were at that session. And I came across this quote by uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, which I thought was very interesting, where he was talking about how, you know, how could they get rid of the military in the 1970s. So this was a period in the 1970s where kind of civil society was like decimated, strikes were illegal, there was this military dictatorship which had taken over in 1964. And what Cardoso sort of says, you know, we need this reactivation of civil societies, professional associations, trade unions, churches, student organizations, study groups, debating circles, social movements. And so what, what happened in Brazil, you know, which started quite a few years after this in the late 1970s with this emergence of the Workers' Party and Lula and, you know, was the, the emergence of what we call a broad coalition, a sort of het very heterogeneous group of interests opposing the state, institutional status quo uh, in Brazil. So we emphasize in the book that this is what's necessary in some sense a real institutional change. Of course, by its nature, that's something very difficult to construct, and I don't have some theory about how that's constructed, but what we try to show, just using these historical examples, is that seems to be crucial in having a very different type of society, because then it's very difficult for one group to kind of set up a narrow oligarchy, okay? So, uh, so that's, you know, so what does that mean? Well, does it mean like, you know, Abimal, Abimal Guzman, you know, we should, you know, give up our jobs as professors, pick up a rifle and go off, you know, to the Monte, you know, to, to, to push for institutional change. Well, that's not what I'm advocating. Uh, but I do think that, you know, it's very important to think about the politics. So I'm going to emphasize, I'm going to start, everyone accuses me of being very negative usually. But I always say, hey, this is a very optimistic view of the world compared to some sort of geographical view of the world, which says, you know, Colombia is poorer than the United States because it's closer to the equator, you know, or Sierra Leone is intrinsically poor, you know, because it's hot and there's malaria and it rains too much or not enough or, you know. So, so you know, I'm not talking about alternative hypotheses. We talk quite a bit about that in the book. Not enough, most people say, but I think that We've written a lot of academic papers about alternative hypotheses. And so hopefully, you know, you see the spirit of the book is, is not to kind of endlessly agonize in some academic way about alternative hypotheses and could we interpret this in another way, which of course, you know, usually we could, but just to try to sort of develop this one way of thinking about the world. Okay, so, so, so let's, let's just think for five minutes. Five minutes, do I have? Let me think for five minutes about this alternate, you know, how we could think about policy and, you know, where would that lead you? And I'll, le I'll end with a couple of sort of constructive things. Okay. And, and, and I'll be very nice about the World Bank. I kind of have this feeling that everyone's going to be very rude about the World Bank in this, uh, in this, in this conference. But actually, there, I'm going to end by talking about one area in which the World Bank is far ahead of academia, as far as I can see. Okay. So, False options. What's false option number one? Well, I already kind of alluded to this. You know, this is the irresistible charm of authoritarian uh, growth. Uh, you know, I was just in Japan talking to a lot of people from the foreign ministry and other people involved in aid and Oxfam and NGOs, and they were all, you know, loving this authoritarian model. And I said, come on, you know, Japan was successful under democracy. Or, you know, J Japanese growth really took off not you know, before the Second World War, but after the Second World War. And this was a democratic regime. This was not some authoritarian model. And anyway, as I already suggested, you know, I, you know, I, I have real problems with this, this interpretation of Chinese economic success. So the book suggests you know, this idea that somehow you know, there's some Chinese model of authoritarian development waiting to be uh, picked up by Sierra Leone as a kind of major uh, misinterpretation. Of course, authoritarian growth was also tried in many sub-Saharan African countries in the 1960s and 1970s with very bad results. Uh, so that's false option. I've already talked about that. Okay. Uh, another option, you know, which you hear quite often, which is very contrary to the spirit of what I'm talking about, is sort of like, you know, this is quoting from Abhijit Banerjee in Esther Duflo's book, can good policies be a first step to good politics. So one idea is just, you know, this is a bit like Russian privatization. People who were consulting on Russian privatization understood that the politics of this was very crucial, but they just said, good economics is good politics. You know, we privatize, that's good economics, but that's going to get the state out of meddling with these companies. And that's good politics. So good economics is good politics. So 
another way of thinking about that would be this so-called modernization hypothesis. Well, you know, you have institutional problems in poor countries. That doesn't matter. Just get economic growth and everything will sort itself out. You know, democracy will come, institutions will improve. So, you know, I, you know, I, I think this is a, of course, you know, one can find examples and actually Abhijit and Esther have some nice examples in their book. Uh, they're very cautious about claiming this is some general theorem, which obviously it isn't. Uh, and in fact, you know, there's, 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 there's approaches to thinking about development, such as a book by Doug North, uh, John Wallace and Barry Weingast, where the opposite is true. In their model, good, uh, good economics in what they call the natural state, which is what a poor country is in, is always a bad politics, in fact. But, you know, I would say two things about this. One, the modernization hypothesis is just not supported by empirical evidence. So we've done a lot of uh, research on this. There's no evidence in the last hundred years, in fact, that countries which grow more rapidly uh, improve institutions. So, of course, one can think of examples uh, where, you know, maybe that was the case, uh, where some particular development path had that flavor. But, the av but on average, there's no tendency for that to be true. And I think that this, this is not a general theorem that good policies are good politics, which means you can't escape trying to think about the politics. Okay? Uh, Engineering prosperity, I won't say anything about that. You know, I, you know, this, just this, uh, the modern approach in development economics is to sort of give up on asking the type of questions that we try to think about in this book. And, uh, you know, I always, always reminded of the, the great, the words of the, the great economist Robert Solow. You know, Robert uh, said that uh, there's two ways of doing a research in economics. You can say more and more about less and less, or less and less about more and more. So, so I guess this is a less and less about more and more type research, but I, you know, I think we're all in favor of diversity. So we should have people doing both less and less about more and more and more and more about less and less. Okay, how would you think about foreign aid? This sounds like you know, I'm, about to, I'm about to build up to some attack on foreign aid. Not at all. You know, this framework suggests that Foreign aid in itself is not the solution to, uh, you know, to the problem of development, which is to do with how political power and political institutions work in society. But that doesn't mean that it's the source of the problem. So I, I tend to strongly disagree that the evidence suggests that foreign aid causes these problems. There's this book that some people know called, De made pe people know called Dead Aid, which sort of basically claims that institutional or you know, dysfunctional politics in poor countries is created by aid. I just don't think there's any evidence for that. Aid is a response to poverty, not the cause. And aid does all sorts of good things in poor countries. You know, technical assistance, it gets houses built, it gets schools built, it gets wells built. It does all sorts of things. Okay, fine, you know, it, some of it gets stolen. What do you expect? Poor countries have bad institutions and dysfunctional politics. You know, I mean, if you're not going to give money to countries with poor institutions, then you will, what are you going to do? Give them to Sweden? Give money to Sweden or something? So I think that's just, you just have to put up with that. So I'm not anti-aid at all. I think aid does lots of good. It just doesn't solve the problem. So what does solve the problem? Well, thinking about the politics. So let me just end very briefly with two positive things to say. You know, and I, this isn't in the book at all. And I, I, in a parallel universe, I wouldn't have talked about this, but I thought the, the context demanded it. So now the head of the World Bank, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, one of the founding members of Partners in Health. So if, if there, some of you in the audience don't know what Partners in Health is, you should go check out their webpage, pih.org. So Partners in Health is this amazing organization that builds hospitals in poor countries and delivers amazing medical uh, care to people in poor countries, state-of-the-art medical care, okay? So they have, you know, uh, so Paul Farmer's a very good friend of mine, and, you know, they have, I'm always telling him, what you have, Paul, is an unarticulated political model. So he always denies that. He denies it absolutely. But I think they have an unarticulated political model. What's their political model? Go to a, go to a PIH hospital. You can look on their webpage. Where are they? Haiti. So this is the first place they started. Where's their huge teaching hospital in Haiti? In Port-au-Prince? No, it's up in Mirabale on the central plateau, miles away from Port-au-Prince and the voracious predatory politicians. Rwanda, they built this huge new flagship hospital. 
Where is that? Kigali, surely, that's the capital, that's where all the people are. No, it's up in the rural mountains on the border of uh, Uganda at Butar Butaro. So they have this sort of under the radar screen kind of unarticulated model of how you deal with dysfunctional politics in poor countries, which is you build stuff in a sort of depoliticized space. So maybe this is a boring model for the World Bank. You know, we just deliver state-of-the-art healthcare to poor people. How boring is that? You know, don't we want like a more exciting World Bank that's going to solve the problems of poor countries? Well, I don't know. I think this is a pretty good model to study and develop more. Here's where the World Bank and many uh, international institutions like it have been ahead of uh, the economics profession. Empowerment, you know, if you think about the logic of this, you know, you could say, okay, you want to solve, you've got to change politics in poor countries, what do you do? Do you come in and, you know, change the electoral system or rewrite the constitution? You know, well, whenever I hear that, I start thinking like a, I'm a sociologist, you know, because you can't restructure or reconfigure politics like that. And even if you could, you know, who knows what would happen? There's just so many unintended consequences. But this, when I was a kid, you know, there was this female, this movement for female empowerment. And female empowerment had a massive impact on gender stereotypes, on gender discrimination. It empowered women to think differently, to demand rights, to act collectively. And that's in some sense a very good model of what needs to happen, or one potential model of what could happen in poor countries. I don't know where all this language of empowerment came from in the development community, but I do know it didn't come from academic social science. I don't know if it came from this, woman, this movement for women's liberation, but it's a, something that the academics haven't got caught up on yet, in my own opinion, but it fits very well with the spirit of the book. So I think there's a lot more conceptualization and whatever that needs to be done about it, but that's another model for thinking about how to change politics in a way which, which is very much in the spirit of our analysis. So I talked much too long, so I'm going to shut up. We have, a, we have about 20, 25 minutes at least for questions. Um, so we'll start with students, but we're not going to exclude uh, non students. All I'd ask is that you, before you ask your question, uh, please stand up and speak loudly because it's a large hall yeah. and you don't have a, you don't have a mic. Yeah, okay. so sometimes in, in class, other students pretend like you're announcing your name <laughs> at a basketball game. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might use their model today. Um, when you ask your questions, but uh, let me be quiet now and ask your questions. Yes, of course. I'm with uh, one of the senior students. Mm -hmm. Well, he's one of the senior students. Uh -huh. You have to speak uh, very loud, so I'm here to shout it out. Okay. Uh, my question is uh, about the name of the book and the explanation that you gave. Uh, the name of the book is Why Nations Fail, yeah. which includes the institutions that you talk about, talked about, the policy makers, the elites in the, in the countries, but also the civil society and the people, the ordinary people who are uh, not necessarily are blamed for the failures, you know, because this failure is a, a, a blame, I think. Um, from the nation that I, I know, it's all the people in the country as a whole. But mostly it happens that the, the, the failed uh, states or countries are failed because of the continuous failures of the elite groups and the, the governments. So don't you think that you are bidding the, 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 the failure blame on the people also, the ordinary people who not necessarily have this, this uh, uh, on their shoulder? Yep. Should I answer that or should I yeah, that? No, let's your answer it. Let's go. Uh -huh. Let's go one more. Okay. No, I mean, I think that the word fail in the title, you know, uh, might be unfortunate because people, some, when they think about failing states, they think about Afghanistan or they think about Somalia or something. And, you know, that, you know, that is a sort of, you know, but we're really, you know, that, that's part of the story here, but it's not the whole story. You know, it's really, uh, it's just about kind of failing in a very simple-minded sense of sort of income per capita. You know, so I know that income per capita is not the only thing we care about, but, but it is something interesting. And so that's what it's really about. So, so, you know, here, why nations fail is just about why nations have poor economic development. 
I mean, in terms of like blaming anybody, I'm not, you know, blaming anybody. I mean, uh, I mean, I just, you know, it's just a description of how, you know, I, you know, I've been very convinced in my own research over the past 20 years that the major problem in countries that I've studied is caused by, you know, their internal dysfunctional political equilibrium. That's often heavily influenced by external forces. Like we emphasize the impact of colonialism, for example, heavily. I just think today, you know, if you look at what the problem is in Sierra Leone, there's lots of problems and they were caused by the colonial system, by pre-colonial politics and institutions. But the impact of the World Bank is really second order compared to other things. So that's just the only thing I'm trying to say. Yes. Robert Wade, um, I wonder if you agree with the proposition that in the two centuries since the Industrial Revolution, only about six, maybe seven non-Western uh, countries have become what you could call developed, and they would be uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, perhaps Russia, perhaps Israel. Some of those are questionable as to how much they are non-Western. But it's very difficult to get much beyond six or seven cases, um, which attest to the great difficulty of economic development. If you agree with that proposition, only six or seven non-Western countries in the past two centuries have become developed, the question is, what is the relationship between that and your argument that it is the combination of inclusive political and inclusive economic institutions that together make for economic success. Do you say that it's only in those non-Western countries, those six or seven, where you have had this combination? Or do you think there's something particularly difficult about non-Western countries in achieving this combination? or something particularly easy in Western countries in achieving this combination of inclusive-inclusive. So the question is, what's yeah. the relationship? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, think that's, I, think that's, I think it's right, it's difficult, but I don't think there's anything particularly distinct about the East Asian cases, except perhaps, you know, features of their history, for example. So, you know, what is it that distinguishes, you know, uh, Japan or South Korea or Taiwan or even China or Vietnam from sub-Saharan Africa? Well, it's a completely different history of political centralization and kind of identity, which means what you could do in Vietnam is very different, Cambodia is very different from what you could do in the Congo or Nigeria, where you don't have the same history of political centralization and so I would say, you know, it's not a coincidence that that happened in, you know, or you have developmental dictators in East Asia, but you don't have developmental dictators in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa, because you can't have developmental dictatorship in that sort of world without any kind of strong centralized state authority. I would say, you know, those are societies in this, lang you know, in this language that made a transition towards more inclusive institutions, I think some of them, you know, took this off-diagonal path. So the story we tell about South Korea or Taiwan is that this was a situation of movement toward, you know, movement through the off-diagonal, like this, the path I was talking about with China. But they then subsequently made a political transition to a more inclusive political system, where, whereas we don't know if that will happen in China. You know, some people say yes, some people say no. I guess, you know, the only prediction of a model such as it is is, you know, and it doesn't make any kind of strong, obviously at this working at this level, it doesn't make a prediction about the hazard rate or something, is that, you know, the current combination is unsustainable as it was in Taiwan and South Korea. But I don't think the Thai, there's no necessary, there's no necessity of going along that path, you know, and think about another country which I actually studied a lot, you know, in the previous incarnation, which is Botswana. You know, Botswana didn't go along this path of authoritarian development. It started out, you know, as a democracy, and yes, it, it was unusual in the sub-Saharan African case. It was able, also able to tap into a history of political centralization, you know, and a, and a kind of cultural homogeneity that most sub-Saharan African countries lacked, although, you know, in many ways that was also massively constructed after independence. But, but that's, you know, or Mauritius. That's not the authoritarian growth path. And even Japan itself is not the authoritarian 
growth path. So I don't think there's any, there's any necessity of going one way kind of round the matrix. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. And I don't think there's anything distinct culturally about Asia. You know, I do think there's this historical element of state formation, you know, an identity. But I don't think that's really cultural. It's just, you know, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I always think of it as political rather than anything else. So state formation. Ishtar uh, Sam from Pakistan. I think as the explanation of what happened historically, you might have captured something which is quite interesting. But as a predictive theory for the future development, I find this based on critical junctures and the small differences in existing institutions which appear to be quite vague and undefinable as to what are these critical junctures. You would describe industrial revolution, you would describe wars, you would describe uh, uh, you know, the diseases as the critical junctures which led from one state to the other. Now, what do you expect for the future this theory to be applicable for development purposes? And that is something which I read your book, found very fascinating. Yeah. But I still am groping in the dark as to what advice uh, does it can, can, can be? How do you go from uh, one state to the other in absence of these critical junctures or what you call as these small differences in the existing institution? Well, if so you can elaborate that, that yeah. might be very helpful. Well, I mean, you yeah. know. To talk about that, the theory needs to be made much more precise and empirical, and you know, and I think that's very context specific. I think one thing is giving advice, another thing is predicting the future. I don't think you can predict the future. You know, history is contingent. History is not the working out of some you know deterministic process determined by whether or not you know you have domesticable species or crops. You know. You know, we try to make that point in the book. You know, Britain was this marginal, kind of pathetic little place in Europe in the early modern period. Nobody would have anticipated that the Industrial Revolution would have happened in Britain. It was just a series of contingencies that created these institutional dynamics in Britain. You know, so I, I, you know, I'm sure that lots of surprising things could happen in the world. So I don't, I'm not really in the business of prediction. You know, I mean, if you wanted me to predict. I'd sort of say, well, my best guess is the world will stay as it is, you know, because it's like a you know, because there's a lot of inertia in any situation. But I can imagine, you know, that you know that very surprising things will happen. So, so I don't think you can predict, but I think that's different from giving policy advice. So at the end, I was trying to make constructive suggestions about how you think about policy in this world, you know, and how you'd not think about policy is let's go and. Pretend that uh, people running, you know, developing countries are benevolent and that they're just waiting for some to come up with a better solution for how to build the mousetrap or something. You know, that's 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 a, that's the way that people have thought about policy. I know that no one really believes that anymore, except maybe in academic economics, people believe it. I think in, my impression is that in international institutions, who actually have to deal with real problems. Nobody really believes that anymore. They all think that governance is important. Or, politics or whatever, you know, whatever language they use for talking about it. But you know, what one needs is a way of thinking about policy which incorporates that in a practical way. I understand that. This is not <coughs> practical. You know, and it's not even a book. If we were going to write a book about you know, how to do policy, we'd have written a completely different book. You know, this, is a, this is a book to try to create a simple framework to think about, you know, about you know, world economic history and about development differences today. And, you know, and I, I agree with you that you know, if you think I agree it doesn't have that predictive content, but you'd have to have some much more carefully articulated theory, you know, data driven, etc., to do that. You know, and that's just not what we're doing here. You know. That's on our agenda, but that's far from where we are at the moment. But I do think you know, that it can guide you to trying to think about these things in the right way. But I'd be the first to admit you know, we're very far from having anything that's useful for pre either prediction or you know, for policy advice. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mike for Rutgers University. Yeah, in the first part of your lecture, um, uh, you didn't talk about endowments and resources. So it just seemed like the, you know, the, the English went to Virginia and uh, uh, Spanish went to South America, and you know, then you talk about the, you know, how things evolved. 
But what about the, you know, the, the Sokolov Engerman story about yeah, the type of resources you have can have a lot to do with the type of institutions you get? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that, I don't want to hear me, I moved away from the microphone, but I'm talking loudly, so hopefully I can hear I mean, I, you know, our work was heavily influenced by the work by uh, Sokolov and Engelman. You know, Sokolov, Sokolov and Engelman uh, did this incredibly seminal uh, historical study of divergence within the Americas. And in fact, you know, the early empirical work that we did in some sense was an attempt to try to think kind of econometrically about lots of the things that they were talking about. So, so, you know, so we owe them a huge intellectual debt just as much as, as we owe to Doug North. I would say, you know, we emphasize much, I, you know, they, we emphasize much less this, the role of, you know, uh, factor endowments along the lines of, you know, whether you could grow sugar cane, you know, or whether you could have gold mines or things like that. Because, you know, I think what really kind of strikes me is this, yes, it's true that it's, you know, I emphasize in my discussion this indigenous population density. I mean, we did empirical work using other things, looking at mortality of Europeans and all sorts of other things. So, you know, I just mentioned this story about indigenous people. I, I always have problems with this, you know, this exam these examples of natural resources, you know, because I always think that natural resources are a bit like the frontier. It depends how you organize them. You know, in Sierra Leone, they have these alluvial diamonds, and everyone calls them, you know, blood diamonds. They cause conflict and illegality and etc. I taught in Australia for two years. In Australia, they had all this alluvial gold. And in Australia, they sort of say, well, this was the origin of democracy in gold. You know, it was this egalitarian gold that created democracy and the secret ballot in Victoria. So here you have the same two resources with two apparently completely different outcomes. And that's all to do with the way that they were exploited. The British set up the Sierra Leone Selection Trust and gave them monopoly on diamond mining in the whole country. In Australia, the elites, the so-called squatters, wanted to do that, but they couldn't do it. And what happened was you had this, everyone got, you paid one pound, you got a mining <coughs> license. And so you had this very different exploitation with very different sort of follow-on consequences of that. So, 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 you know, I, I, so we have, we differ, we can and stand, differ, uh, we differ on that. But, but I would, you know, I would say that's a, if nobody, if people don't know that work, it's wonderfully inspiring. Yes. Yes, it would seem as though the sacking institutions was actually more compatible with a law. Oh, yeah, I can't hear you. Stand up, then. sorry, speak a little louder, please. Yeah. It would seem as though your sacking institutions would be more compatible with a law of oligarchy. When you're looking at extractive institutions, are those really a, a inferior form of organization, or do you see those as an alternative model? which various types of societies still make preferential choices to have? Uh, well, I mean, I think we see them inferior in the sense that they limit the economic potential of the society. You know, they limit the society's ability to use the skills and talents of its, you know, of its, of its, of its people. I mean, if you have, you know, uh, if you have people, you know, working, you know, think about the U.S. South, you know, prior to the Civil War, although the South, of course, was richer than lots of other parts of the world, it was poorer, less urbanized, much less industry, you know, much less infrastructure, less innovative in, you know, even in the crops in which it specialized. Uh, most southern states, it was illegal to teach black people to read and write before the Civil War wasting massive potential, you know. Slaves don't have incentives, you know, you didn't invest in the human capital site. That's, you know, that was a system, of course, which was enormously good for the planter elite, but it was very bad for the slaves, and it was very bad socially, I guess. That's also, you know, what I would say. So, 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 so that's, that's the story in the book. Oh, well, the is from California. Uh, Right now, it seems to me that there are certain nations that are failing, like Greece and Spain. Uh -huh. And this, the government debts that seem to be escalating could even cause our nation to fail. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so, so that's a very good question. I would say, you know, so in, in, in this book, uh, 
Spain and Greece have inclusive institutions. Okay, so you know these are very coarse bins, and there's a lot of variability in any of the bins. I would say, you know, big picture, you know, you think about Spain you know, over the last sort of 30 years or something. You know, Spain, you know, in the early 1980s, the army was still, you know, trying to mount coup d'etats against democracy in Spain. You know, that sp consolidated democracy is a new thing in Spain. You know, Spain has changed dramatically in a positive direction since the 1970s, you know, and you could say the same thing for Greece. I don't think, you know, uh, you could say there's many perverse incentives built into any system, you know, that there's a very perverse system of like subnational financing in, you know, in Spain, or there's rent seeking, or they could try to free ride off, you know, Brussels or whatever. But I guess I would say, okay, there's a lot of problems at the moment. You know, there's very high unemployment, there's all of this financial crisis, you know, there's this unwinding of this massive housing bubble. But I would sort of say, you know, big picture, I would be, well, I think, you know, Spain has a very, has a, has a democratic system, you know, it has inclusive political institutions. It's always possible for kind of rent-seeking elites to sort of embed themselves at anything like that. And maybe it will take time to un to, for that to unwind. But I would be kind of optimistic that in the long run, you know, that society will, will, will bounce back, you know. And, I, you know, I don't think that Greece is like, you know, I was talking to a Spanish journalist yesterday, and he was very upset with me when I said that. I said, look, you know, Spain has Zara, you know, it has banks, it has, like, internationally competitive entrepreneurship. But, you know, this, this is not like, no, he said, no, it's just like Colombia. It is not like Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Monty, uh, in your framework, with being uh, like an uh, inclusive, inclusive nation, is it possible, you know, for like a uh, populist sentiment and behavior that leads to a nation to feel like overspending and providing, and, you know, over providing a social welfare? You know? Yeah, so that's a very good question too. So, so I, you know, we in the book we talk about inclusive political institutions, and you might think, well, isn't that the same as democracy? And I guess what we try to emphasize is that you can have very dysfunctional democracies. You think about Venezuela at the moment. You know, Venezuela is a sort of 51% of people love President Chavez and 49% of people hate him, or maybe the other way around, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and that's a sort of, you know, tyranny of the majority, you know, that someone gets in power and there's no checks and balances and they try to, you know, they try to do it, put it into the other people. And if the other people got into power, they do it to the Chavistas as well. So, so this is, you know, I wouldn't call that an inclusive political institution. There's no kind of checks and balances or limitations on how power can be used. Of course, the interesting thing from a kind of intellectual point of view, which, which we've done some research on is, you know, in some sense, Venezuelans brought that on themselves, you know, in the sense that, you know, this is like kind of parenthetic remark, is that, you know, trying to understand when inclusive, you know, when a kind of inclusive democracy as opposed to this tyranny of the majority type democracy is an equilibrium is sort of very interesting, you know, because, you know, in some sense, society collectively chooses checks and balances. And when President Chavez came to power, you know, people voluntarily got rid of checks and balances in Venezuela. And they've done that elsewhere in Ecuador or Bolivia or whatever. So that's a, from a kind of academic point of view, that's an interesting thing to understand. But I guess I'm just saying here that, you know, that we would, you know, we would say that this is, that, that this is not an inclusive political institution, even though you know, it's democratic. You know, most people would say Colombia was a democracy, you know, but I'm suggesting there's enormous non-inclusive aspects to Colombian politics and society. Um, I'm Chao from China. I just really, uh, want to bring up the example of three countries, uh, India, China, and Singapore. I would say perhaps uh, on one hand, we would call all three countries economically inclusive, but I would probably just had a guess that you would call India more politically inclusive. Uh -huh. But why is it a, a, that as it appears to me that China and Singapore seem to be doing perhaps better on, uh, on some fronts, you know, in eliminating uh, poverty or um, uh, more economic progress. So is it because perhaps centralized government or centralized power will actually in certain circumstances help to solve problems more quickly or more efficiently? I think that's true. You know, I mean, the Soviet state was able to move people from the countryside where they were producing nothing and stick them in a factory where they were much more productive and that generated a lot of economic growth for 40 years. So, so effective centralized states can do that. You know, I would say, you know, uh, if you think about Singapore, 
According to Angus Madison's estimates, around about the time of the First World War, Argentina had the same level of income per capita as the United States did. So there's plenty of other experiences in history of you know, countries being in a kind of very favorable market niche at the right place at the right time and doing well for quite long periods of time, but without having a functional political system. I mean, you know, if I look at South at Singapore, I say, this is like Lee Kuan Yew and his son. So this is very, very far from having a, a, having a kind of well-institutionalized political system which can guarantee Singapore's prosperity in the long run. So, so, you know, I would say it's much too early to know what will happen in Singapore, uh, so. I think we're going to do one more question. So, um, so, I will. Um, so I, I, I found your, the story of an inclusive beginning in the U.S. and extracted beginning in Mexico, Peru, Paraguay, uh, very compelling. But I wonder if, um, I wonder if you can dig if you dig a, a level deeper, or whether it's just an accident. So I guess the question is, why did, uh, so, so is it, why was the Indian chief in Jamestown less hierarchical, more difficult to capture than the Guarani chief, or, or you know, or, or Montezuma? Why, is, is there, is there, what's, what's? Yeah, so well that's a complicated issue. I mean, I actually never understood, maybe there's an archaeologist in the audience, you know, but <laughs> I've never understood, you know, some people say, well, your theory is just a theory that geography determines institutions and blah, blah, blah. And they, the evidence for that is, well, geography determined the distribution of the indigenous population in the Americas in 1492. But I, you know, I used to teach at Berkeley, and I always found it very odd, you know, that indigenous people supposedly came across the Bering Strait. They kind of walked right through Berkeley and they sort of said, eh, you know, not too interesting. But then they got to the Altiplano in Peru and they thought, hey, this looks like a really good place to, to be. You know, why was it that you had, you know, why, you know, why was it that you had this enormous density of population in some parts of the Americas? but not in others. And obviously, you know, there's some proximate relationship with water or, you know, maize varieties and things like that. But I think that has a very low R squared in terms of sort of trying to actually explain how that, how that sort of looked like. You know. so, 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 I mean, I think that's a good question. I, I'm not enough of a scholar, perhaps, of those things to know the answer. That's a sort of initial condition here. Hmm. So I'm afraid I think we're out of time. That was fantastic.